Welcome to the John Campia Podcast, Episode 2, for Tuesday, March the 8th, 2016. Hey guys, on this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about J.K. Simmons being our new Commissioner Gordon, Margot Robbie talking a little bit about her Harley Quinn look, what will the Batman vs. Superman rating be on Rotten Tomatoes, breaking down UFC 196, and of course, what did I think about the new Ghostbusters trailer. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Sit back, relax. The John Campia Podcast starts right now. Well, hey there, guys, and welcome to episode two of the John Campia podcast. It's me, John Campia. I'm flying solo today just because of the timing of when we had to record this episode. I'm on my lonesome. Aaron can't be here today, but that's one of the wonderful, magnificent things about this new podcast that I'm doing is that I can do it from home. We can do it whenever we feel like it, whenever we have to do it. I'm enjoying this a great deal. Uh, First of all, a special thank you to all of you guys yesterday uh, who tuned into the first episode of the John Campbell podcast is the first one we launched. I mean, this is a show gets no promotion. I just mentioned on my Twitter, my Facebook, I was kind of hoping to get somewhere between three and 5,000 listeners, but between the podcast on iTunes and putting it up on my Facebook channel as well, we got like between 15 and 20,000 listens yesterday. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you uh, who downloaded and listened to the show yesterday and appreciate all your feedback and stuff like that. So it was great. Today's a busy day. Um, first of all, doing this show here in the morning, uh, later this afternoon, of course, it's Tuesday, which means it's time for heroes. So me and John Schnepp and, uh, Umberto Gonzalez will be doing uh, the episode of heroes a little bit later this afternoon. Make sure you go and check that out on the Collider YouTube channel. Uh, and then later today, I, I, I cannot wait to tell you guys about my new gigs. Um, now, as I mentioned on yesterday's show, This podcast, the John Campia podcast, is not my new gig. This is something I am doing for fun because I just love getting online and talking about movies. That's just what I love to do. I am very excited to tell you guys about the new gigs I have coming up. Uh, I, I can't do it yet, but tomorrow I've got a meeting in Hollywood uh, in the early evening about one of the new gigs and I'm really stoked about, and we're getting closer to me being able to tell you guys about it. I'm confident I'll be able to tell you by, about at least one of them by the time WonderCon comes along. So, uh, keep your ears open to that. Speaking of WonderCon, which is coming up here in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles convention center, it's run by the same people who run the San Diego comic-con and, but it's called WonderCon. It's being held in Los Angeles at the end of this month in March And uh, John Schnepp, myself, and the crew from Heroes is going to be doing a panel um, over at WonderCon. It was one of my last things that I did when I was still at Collider was that I arranged for uh, for us to have a panel for Heroes at WonderCon. Super excited about it. John Schnepp is going to be hosting it. Um, It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you're in Los Angeles... Make sure you come on by and join us there. And one last mention thing here is uh, for those of you who are already subscribed, that's awesome. Make sure, even if you don't use iTunes to subscribe, do me a favor to really help me out. If you subscribed on iTunes, rated this podcast and left a comment, that would uh, help me out a lot. So... As I mentioned off the top, we got a whole bunch of things to talk about today. Uh, A lot of big news items. Going to talk about, I wanted to do it yesterday, but we're going to talk about UFC 196 a little bit later in the show as well. But today we've got to start off with this. This was a piece of news that dropped just an hour or two after we finished doing yesterday's podcast. And that is this. Academy Award winner, J.K. Simmons. This is being reported by The Hollywood Reporter, so you know it's true. J.K. Simmons has been cast as your new Commissioner Gordon for the upcoming Justice League film. So Commissioner Gordon will not be in Batman v Superman. I think we all knew that already because we would have heard about it by now. But J.K. Simmons, uh, who of course was J. Jonah Jameson in the Spider-Man movies, and we loved him in that so much, I was kind of secretly hoping he would return as J. Jonah, even though this is a reboot. And I normally don't like the same actors coming back for a reboot. Because, you know, if you're going to reboot something, well, then for fuck's sakes, just reboot it. And that means get all new casts. But 
I was willing to make an exception personally as a fan for JK coming back as J. Jonah. That's probably not happening now, but I got to tell you, I think I am just as happy about this. J.K. Simmons playing Commissioner Gordon is nothing short of brilliant. Now, there were a lot of people out there who thought for sure that the great Brian Cranston, uh, who was nominated for an Academy Award this year for Trumbo, a lot of people were hoping for and thought that we were going to hear an announcement pretty soon of Brian Cranston being cast as Commissioner Gordon. And I, I, look, I'll tell you this. Had they announced Brian Cranston as the new Commissioner Gordon, I would have been very pleased. As a fan, me personally, I would have been very pleased, very happy. I know a lot of you guys are in the same boat as me. Now, with that being said, I think I am more happy with the idea of JK playing this role. Now, for a lot of you thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, G- Commissioner Gordon isn't supposed to be this comedical blah, blah, blah. What? Look, J.K. Rowling, uh, J.K. Rowling, <laughs> J.K., very different person. J.K. Simmons has an Oscar on his mantle for a reason. And it wasn't for a comedy. If you saw Whiplash and you saw, now look, he didn't play Commissioner Gordon in Whiplash. His character wasn't a James Gordon kind of character in Whiplash, but If you saw that film, you know what kind of intensity and what kind of screen presence and most importantly, what kind of performance that J.K. Simmons is capable of bringing. Look, Brian Cranston would have as well, no doubt. But I'm just telling you, I hadn't even considered J.K. Simmons for Commissioner Gordon. I hadn't heard anything about it. I didn't hear that as any of the whispers. I didn't hear that that was in the wind. I didn't hear that there was a short list. None of that. I didn't even know for sure that there was going to be a Commissioner Gordon in the Justice League films. I I didn't even know that for sure. So they kept this. Warner Brothers did a great job at keeping this a secret and keeping it from everybody. And I I just got to tell you, I am super happy about it. I think he's going to be magnificent. And especially when you consider that he is going to be coming into this film and acting a character based on a screenplay by Academy Award winner Chris Terrio, who's writing the Justice League films, probably with a hand in there from Ben Affleck as well, doing that. And of course, Chris Terrio won his Academy Award for doing Argo, Uh, which by the way, who else was in Argo besides Ben Affleck? Brian Cranston, which was another reason that I think a lot of people thought that if they were going to do a Commissioner Gordon in this new DC Cinematic Universe, you knew they would want somebody that worked well with Ben Affleck. Well, hey, in Argo, which won Best Picture, Ben Affleck acted alongside of Brian Cranston on a screenplay by Chris Terrio. So we already know Brian Cranston could do a great job, you know, acting off of a script by Chris Terrio, acting alongside of Ben Affleck. So you can totally understand why a lot of people thought and felt and believed that if they do a Commissioner Gordon, it was going to be Brian Cranston. You can totally see that. So I, I get it. A lot of people were surprised yesterday when the announcement came out that J.K. Simmons was playing Commissioner Gordon. But I got to tell you, I was surprised too but super, super happy. Now, the one sad part of this, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, is the fact that this pretty much closes the coffin on any hope that, you know, a naive twit like myself might have had about J.K. Sims coming back to Spider-Man to play J. Jonah again. I mean, there was rumors going around yesterday, too, that Ice Cube could be up for J. Jonah. I, you know what, if they were going, it it all depends on the feel that Marvel uh, and Sony are going for in this new Spider-Man. If they want it a lot more lighthearted, like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, then Ice Cube could be a really interesting fit to play J. Jonah. Otherwise, I don't think he's the right guy, but if they are going more lighthearted and they want it to be a little bit more comedic, then getting Ice Cube in there could actually be a really interesting fit. But still me. I wanted J.K. Simmons back in that role. But I am super stoked that he is going to be our Commissioner James Gordon. You know, the age is right. 
Um, I think they wanted somebody a little bit older than the traditional James Gordon. And I think JK is right for that. Because remember, we've got a, a little bit of an older Batman. We've got a Batman in his 40s here. So I think the age is good. I think you've got all the talent in the world with this guy, which is going to be just absolutely freaking amazing. I think this is a great, great turn of events. And we are all going to be super, super happy um, with the results. All right. Let's move on to the next item. And the next item here, this is entering, staying in the DC Cinematic Universe. We all know that we've got Margot Robbie coming up playing Harley Quinn in the new DC Cinematic Universe film, Suicide Squad. The, the film that's going to be following up Batman v Superman just a couple of months after Batman v Superman hits. Now, one of the things that a lot of people were interested in after we heard that Margot Robbie was going to be playing Harley Quinn and, and it was confirmed that Harley Quinn was going to be in the film was what's her look going to be? What's she going to be wearing? Cause she has some very, very iconic looks from the cartoon show. And in some of the, in some of the uh, comic books as well, she has some iconic looks and what we saw in the trailers so far is kind of a departure from what we've traditionally known as Harley Quinn, but it's definitely the looks we've seen Margot Robbie wearing are definitely Harley Quinn esque, if you know what I'm saying. Like they're kind of more from taken from like the Arkham kind of Harley Quinn than they are from the traditional animated series and stuff like that. And I think all of us have been happy. I mean, I've heard some people complain, not many, but some people complain about the look of Jared Leto's uh, Joker. Some people complain about the look of Croc. Or some people complain about the look of Enchantress. But I gotta tell you, I maybe I'm just not remembering it right, but I can't think of any conversation I've had with anybody that had a real problem with the look of Harley Quinn in these Suicide Squad images and in the Suicide Squad trailers. I can't think of anybody. But still, that being said, there is a traditional iconic look for Harley Quinn in that court jester outfit. I mean, that's the one we're really kind of used to seeing her in standing alongside the Joker in the animated series. And as it turns out, in a recent interview that Margot Robbie did about the upcoming Suicide Squad, she confirmed that this Harley Quinn almost wore that traditional court jester outfit. Here's what she said in her interview. Margot Robbie said this. I'm reading her verbatim here. She said, We tried on every variation of the costume. I cannot emphasize enough how many outfits and how many variations of the Harley Quinn costume we tried. We tried the court jester costume. We tried the corset and skirt. We tried leather pants. We tried literally every type of costume possible for her. I really love where we ended up. And who knows? Maybe in the sequels, we'll go with the court jester one. I think there's a world of possibility. So, I mean, it sounds like the filmmakers for Suicide Squad, David Ayer and things like that, they were actually considering the court jester outfit. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there, a lot of like purists for the animated uh, stuff, the animated show and stuff like that and the traditional Harley Quinn that we've seen that are lamenting this news right now. It's like, oh, we should have had the court jester outfit because that's the look of Harley Quinn. And I got to tell you, while I will personally be pretty interested to see what, you know, Margot Robbie would look like in that traditional court jester Harley Quinn outfit, I got to be honest with you, I think not having the outfit was the right call. Look, if you guys have been following me for any amount of time, you know that I really believe this. The number one job of filmmakers of uh, comic book related stuff. They're, the number one job is not to be as close to the comic book as possible. That's not the goal. That's not their job. Their job is to give us the best movie possible, the best characters possible. And sometimes just because something works on a printed comic book page or just because something works in an animated cartoon does not mean that that would automatically translate well into live action. You know, I've always thought that the Captain America outfit would work on the big screen. I've always believed that the Thor costume would work well on the big screen. However, I've also always believed 
that the traditional yellow spandex of Wolverine would not work on the big screen. It would look silly and it wouldn't work well with the character. And I think for, except for comic book purists who represent 1% of the movie going audience, I don't think anybody else would have liked it. And while I love seeing Harley Quinn in that court jester outfit, that iconic look for her that we've known from the animated show and the comic books, while I love it on her in the comic books and in the animated show, had you tried to bring that into the live action, I think it just would have looked silly. I mean, well, John, are you saying her outfit of those super tight little, little sex me shorts and ripped shirt and multicolored jacket that that looks something normal people would wear? No, 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 not at all. I'm not saying that in the least, but it looks badass on her the way she's wearing it. And I just don't think that that traditional court jester look would have worked. Look, here's the, here's the key to this. When you look at Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, does she kind of embody the spirit of Harley Quinn? And I would say for most people when they, hey, there's this new comic book movie coming out. Here's Margot Robbie. Who do you think she's playing? I think 90% of people who know who Harley Quinn is would go, oh, that must be their look for Harley Quinn. Because clearly that is Harley Quinn, even though she's not wearing the traditional outfit that we're used to seeing her in. That's clearly Harley Quinn. And when you can do that, I have no problem taking a departure from the traditional or the the iconic looks, as long as you kind of capture the spirit of it to the point that the average person can look at the character and clearly know, oh, that's that character. Even though that's not the clothes we're used to seeing them in, if somebody can look at that character in a different outfit and go, well, that is clearly Harley Quinn, then I think you've done a good job. And I think the looks, look, Margot Robbie looks sexy as fuck no matter what you put her in. I mean, you can wrap her in a bedsheet you know, with blue paint poured over it and she would find a way to make it look hot. But she looks amazing in these Harley Quinn out, uh, these Harley Quinn pictures and videos we've seen from the movie so far. And, you know, I see no reason to change that up. I think they've done a great job. All right, let's move on to the next thing. This one's kind of interesting. I kind of wish John Schnepper here right now uh, because he loves these sorts of topics. Because, you know, sometimes people get like, wait a minute, you're doing a Monopoly movie and you're doing a Pez movie and, you know, a lot of people get upset. Well, guess what, guys? Even they was announced back in 2011 that MGM was going to try to develop a Where's Waldo movie. Now, we've heard little rumblings about a potential Where's Waldo movie for a couple of years now, but it never hit you know, critical mass. It never sounded like it was really, truly about to happen. You know what I'm saying? Um, But now there's a report coming out of the tracking board that says, so take this with a grain of salt, because this isn't Variety and this isn't The Hollywood Reporter, but tracking board has been uh, an interesting thing, source for information, but that Seth Rogen and his uh, writing producing partner, Evan Goldberg, are actually looking, they may possibly be producing this Where's Waldo movie which sounds kind of nuts to me. It it actually sounds a little bit of insane, Um, but apparently it would like, from what I'm reading in the reports, it's saying that this would be a very interesting Where's Waldo movie. Uh, It was once set up at Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon, and then their rights went back to Universal, and then MGM got the rights and all this kind of stuff. But now they're sitting at MGM, and they're talking about it might even involve some time travel, in the story, it's supposed to have some heart. It's going to be live action because we all know that uh, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg are doing an animated film next. They've got that Sausage Party uh, movie coming out here pretty soon. So that'll be interesting to see. So they're talking that these two guys might be doing a Where's Waldo movie. And look, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to get too negative about projects that sound like this because I was very negative about the idea of a Lego movie. Like when they first announced the idea of a Lego movie, I was pretty negative about it. I thought, look, they're building block toys. How are you going to make a movie about this? Blah, blah, blah. But what, um, what those guys did, what Lord and Miller did, the directors of that film, What they did was they had an incredibly heartwarming, touching, funny story, and then they just applied that story to the world of Lego. They didn't make a movie about Lego. They started with a great, 
funny, heartwarming, entertaining story, and then just wrap that story around the Lego property, and they ended up with something really great. So with that as the template, you know, I mentioned this on Movie Talk once, like even a, a, a something as stupid as a Pez movie, like how stupid, like does it get any more stupid than that? But... If you got a studio and filmmakers who have a great story that is touching and warm and funny and human at its heart, and then they just take that great story and apply it to Pez, then it can work. If you make a movie about Pez, it's not going to work. It's just going to be stupid. But if you start with a great story, just that forget that what it's about. Forget that it's about Pez. Forget that it's about Lego. Forget that it's about Where's Waldo. If you start with a great story that is funny and touching, and entertaining, and all that kind of stuff, and then take that story and apply it to anything. Apply it to Lego. Apply it to Where's Waldo. Apply it to Pez. Apply it to the Monopoly, because we got a Monopoly movie coming. Then it can work. So while on its surface, the idea of a Where's Waldo movie sounds pretty dumb to me, let's wait and see. I mean, look, that is my first reaction, is it sounds like a dumb idea. Yes, but I thought this, a lot of us thought the same thing about Lego. So let's take a breath. Let's see what they're, and look, uh, Angry Birds. I mean, we all thought that was a stupid idea too, but the majority of people out there really like the trailers we're seeing so far. Now, those aren't the Angry Birds we've seen in the video game. It's something different. It's it's characters and life they brought to it and then applied it to the Angry Birds IP, the Angry Birds intellectual property, their brand. And it kind of works. So if, when you get guys like Seth Rogen and, and Evan up, uh, attached, if they are indeed attached, and we'll keep our eyes peeled on this to see if MGM actually confirms this, but if they do then maybe you got something here that can work. Who knows? Let's keep our eyes open. All right, let's move on to the last topic of the day before we get to the Twitter questions that you guys sent in. And this one is rather interesting. We got Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, as you know, has been making a big resurgence lately, not so much with Terminator, Genesis, and all that kind of stuff. But he's been in a couple of what I thought have been underrated films. The one, the one prison break movie he just did with Arnold Schwartz with, uh, uh, with Sylvester Stallone. Um, I can't remember the name of it now at the top of my head, but it was like either it was, I think it was escape or something like that. Anyway, that was actually not a bad little film. It did terribly did really bad, but it was not a bad little film. And then there was that other action film that he just did. And again, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's the one where he's the small town sheriff and there's the criminal and the fastest car on earth and all that kind of stuff. I actually thought that was really fun. And Johnny Knoxville was in it as well. I thought that was a fun, entertaining little film. And I thought Arnold was really good in it. But once again, nobody went to go see it. And so it kind of failed. But a lot of people are interested in the fact that Arnold is saying that they are going to do another Conan movie. Like he's, I haven't heard the studio say it's greenlit yet, but Arnold is saying, hey, make no mistake about it. This movie is happening. We are doing another Conan well, now there's some whispers going around that he might be returning to yet another one of his iconic kind of roles, and that is Dutch from Predator. Now, as many of you will remember, Shane Black, who directed Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which is awesome, he directed Iron Man 3, he directed the upcoming movie um, Nice Guys with Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe, which looks absolutely amazing. I cannot wait to see. I think this is going to be one of the best films of the year. All I've seen is a couple of trailers, but I think Nice Guys is going to end up being one of the best films of the year. The, the feel of the trailer is great. It's got a wonderful feel. It's got a little bit of kiss, kiss, bang, bang feel to it with a little bit of LA Confidential in there as well. I'm super stoked about this. It's going to be great. But anyway, Shane Black, a long time ago, almost two years ago now, they announced that Shane Black would be doing a new Predator movie. Well, apparently that's still on and that's still going. And in a recent interview, Arnold Schwarzenegger said this. He says, I haven't talked with Shane Black yet, but I'm going to meet with him for lunch sometime soon, just as I'm just as soon as I'm finished with the festival and The Apprentice and all this stuff. But I will get together with him. If there is any news, we'll of course let you know right away. There's also a meeting coming up soon about Conan, about the project moving forward. So Arnold says a couple of things in that comment. Number one, he kind of confirms again that they are indeed doing 
another Conan film. So every chance Arnold gets right now, he keeps telling people we're doing a Conan film. We're doing a Conan film. And he's been saying that for a while. So I'm starting to feel a little bit like when, when McFarlane keeps talking about how, Oh, we're going to do, um, uh, we're going to do another this and we're going to do another that, uh, but it never comes to pass. So it's okay, Arnold. I'll believe it when we see it. It's like, okay, McFarland, I'll believe you're doing another Spawn movie when I see a trailer because you've been talking about this for years. And I'm starting to feel that way about Conan with Arnold Schwarzenegger because he's been talking for years now. Oh, we're doing another Conan. We're doing another Conan. Well, gosh, dude, you're not getting any younger. You better do one soon. But anyway, the idea, here's why this is super interesting. The idea of maybe him coming back to Predator as Dutch. Number one, you don't have to make him the main character. I mean, you can if you want, but he doesn't even have to be the main character. He can kind of be like a Carl Weathers character that Carl Weathers was in the first Predator or a Jesse the Body Ventura kind of character. You can make Dutch the side character if you want, or you can make him lead and do whatever you want. But the really interesting thing is, is that by putting Arnold in that movie, if that's what they're doing, okay, that's a big if. Because remember, all we're hearing Arnold saying is that he's having lunch with Shane Black. That doesn't necessarily mean anything at all. So let's keep that in mind. But let's, again, just for the sake of discussion, let's explore this for a second. Let's say it does mean something. Let's say it means he is going to be in the new Predator. Again, that's not what they're saying, but let's just explore that for fun, okay? By him coming back and reprising his role as Dutch, what that automatically means is that this is not a reboot per se. This is in the same continuity. It means the events of the original Predator are still at play. They're still real. Because I mean, when you look at Alien versus Predator 1 and 2 and all that kind of stuff, I mean, those could have been reboots because there was nothing really that connected them to the original Predator. Um, Even the most recent Predator movie, which wasn't all that bad, actually. That wasn't a bad little movie. But even the most recent Predator, you you could say that was a reboot because there was nothing really there that connected it to the original story that happened uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. But you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in, suddenly now it's canon. Suddenly now you've got a, a Predator cinematic universe, sort of in a way. And I think this would be interesting. I really do. Look, does Shane Black need Arnold Schwarzenegger to come back in order to make Predator a viable option? No, he does not. I think Predator will do just fine as a movie under the guidance of Shane Black with or without Arnold Schwarzenegger. But as a fan, as somebody who's a fan of both Arnold Schwarzenegger and as a fan of the original Predator, I got to say I'm intrigued. I mean, I don't know what you guys feel. Like maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking, ah, no, that would just be sad to bring Arnold back. Just let it go, let it go. I would totally understand where you're coming from. If that's your feel, if you feel like, Having Arnold come back right now would just be a dumb gimmick. It would kind of be sad. I I understand where you're coming from and I'm not going to debate you on it because I totally get where you're coming from. All I can tell you is that for me personally, I think the idea of Arnold coming back for Predator as Dutch again, directed by Shane Black, I think that could be kind of interesting. So, you know, we'll keep our eyes on it. Okay, guys. Well, as uh, I started yesterday, I'm going to like to end every show by taking some of your questions that you send in to me via Twitter. And the easiest way and the only way to get those questions to me is send out a tweet and simply include the hashtag, hashtag TJCP, the John Campia podcast. So just hashtag TJCP, make sure that hashtag is included in your tweet and that way it will make its way to me and I'll be able to see it. So I've picked out a bunch of Twitter questions here that I'm going to address real quick before we end off today's show. And the first one comes today from Matt Murr 247 and Matt Murr 247 writes, what do you think Batman versus Superman will get on Rotten Tomatoes? I hope Batman versus Superman is not as split as Man of Steel was. Hashtag TJCP. Um, it's look, I Matt, I've been getting a lot of people asking me that. And I still, for the life of me, still for the life of me, do not understand the lukewarm rating that Man of Steel has. Now, granted, the majority of film critics like the film. It's got, I think, a 55 or 56%. So that means the majority of the film critics liked it. But that should be 90. That should be 85. That should be 87. I still contend, and I will argue with anybody till I am blue in the face, because I've watched the film now probably about 12 times, Man of Steel is flipping brilliant. 
I think it is a marvelous take on Superman. I think the movie is fun. I think it's deep. I think it's deeper than people give it credit for. I love the exploration of the character and the, uh, you know, kind of the trials and tribulations that Clark faces both externally in the form of Zod and others, but also internally what he faces. I think it's a brilliant film. I know you guys have heard me say that all the time, but every time Man of Steel comes up, I'm going to echo how much I love that film. Anyway, that being said, um, the core question here is, and I've gotten a lot of people over the past while emailing me and, t- and tweeting me and Facebook messaging me saying, what do you think Batman versus Superman is going to get on Rotten Tomatoes? And honestly, the most pure answer to that is who the hell knows? I, I mean, really, who knows what it's going to get? It's impossible to say. I-, I just, any guess would be a pure blind speculation guess because we haven't seen the movie. So I've, I have no idea there, but even if I did see the movie, cause I saw man of steel and I would, after seeing man of steel, I would have guessed, man, this movie's going to get 80%. And we all saw how that turned out. No, it didn't. It got a 56. So any guess by anybody at this point is a pure speculative, unfounded shot in the dark guess. For me personally, I will take that shot. I'll take an, a completely wild stab in the dark at it. And I'll say this. I have talked to a couple of people who have seen the film. Everybody I know that has seen the film. Now, granted, they're all connected to the film in one way or the other. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. But everybody that I have spoken to that has actually seen the film really likes it. Like very enthusiastically, they very, very much like it. So based on nothing else other than that, I will take a wild stab in the dark based on absolutely nothing and say, I think Batman versus Superman will get a 73%. I think it'll get a 73%. That's a wild stab in the dark. I might totally change my mind after I see the film myself, either higher or lower. I don't know. But since you're asking the question, I'll take that stab in the dark and I'm going to guess Batman Superman will get a 73% on Rotten Tomatoes. Jump into the comments, either on the iTunes or on the YouTube page or in your podcasting. Let me know what do you, and look, no one's going to hold you to this because it's just a wild stab in the dark guess. What is your best wild stab in the dark guess? What will the Rotten Tomatoes rating be for Batman versus Superman? Let me know. All right. Let's move on to the next one here. And the next uh, question comes from Dirty in Vegas, (laughs) like the name. And he writes, uh, John Campia, what do you think, or what did you think of UFC 196? Well, yeah, uh, UFC 196 just happened. Was crazy looking forward to that card. You got Ewan McGregor versus Nate Diaz. You had the new champion, Holly Holm, who, of course, beat Ronda Rousey, taking on Misha Tate. And I got to tell you, I I love the results. And here's the thing. While I picked Conor McGregor to beat Nate Diaz, I did. I I picked him to beat Nate Diaz, like, because I, I still thought he was going to pull it out. I was telling everybody who would listen, look, Conor McGregor taking this fight at 170 pounds is a mistake. It was a big mistake. Because Nate Diaz is naturally, he walks around at a heavier weight than Conor McGregor does. Nate Diaz has length and Nate Diaz, a lot of people forget because the the Diaz brothers, both Nick and Nate, they have great boxing. They do. But that makes everybody forget that they are world-class jujitsu guys at the same time. You get on the floor with these guys and they're dangerous. I've seen Nate Diaz submit, pull these wild submissions on people out of nowhere before. Um, and so now here's the thing though, going up two weight classes, Conor McGregor didn't just go up one weight class. Remember, this isn't pussy boxing where like every six ounces is a new weight class. This is UFC, man, where you gotta go 10, 15 pounds to change a weight class. Conor McGregor was going from, I think 155, uh, or 145 to 170. He was going from 145, where he normally fights. He normally fights. He doesn't walk around at 145, but he fights at 145, and he was going up 25 pounds, all right, to 170. And what I told her, and me and Dennis had some conversations about this too, and what I told everybody, it's like, look, here's the problem. Nate Diaz is a good boxer. 
So when he hits Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor is not used to being hit with a guy who will have 25 more pounds of power behind him than what he's going to get when he gets hit by Nate Diaz. He's When he does get hit on the face, he gets hit on the face by a guy who yesterday weighed 145 pounds. That's what he's accustomed to. That's what he's used to. When he now gets cracked by a guy who's got 25 pounds more weight behind him than a guy he fights at 145, that is going to be a make it, that's going to make a difference because he's not used to that. But this was the bigger thing. Here's the bigger thing. Everybody knows in the UFC and everybody who follows the UFC knows that Conor McGregor's one Achilles heel is grappling. All right. He's not a great wrestler. We saw that against Chad Mendez. Chad Mendez took him down pretty easy. Now, fortunately, Connor did a really good job against Chad Mendes of defending and eventually being able to get back up to his feet, right? But here's the problem. Now he's fighting a guy in Nate Diaz who is 25 pounds heavier than what Connor McGregor is used to wrestling with on the ground. So look, you get Chad Mendes on top of you. It's great that you're able to find a way to escape, but guess what? If Chad Mendes is 25 pounds heavier, that makes that escape that much more difficult and that much harder. Because you saw in the fight, man, once Diaz got on top of Conor McGregor, it was done. It was absolutely done. He was outclassed. Now, he was Conor McGregor was going to be outclassed on the ground against Nate Diaz no matter what, but Could Conor McGregor just have enough to still be able to defend and escape? Possibly. But then you compound that by the fact that Nate was going to have 25 more extra pounds than what Conor is used to dealing with. And everybody can say to me, yeah, but John, Conor was going to weigh 25 pounds heavier than he normally does too. Yes, but that doesn't change the fact that what he is used to in his last 50, in his 15 fight win streak in the UFC, what he is used to, he's being punched by a guy who's 25 pounds lighter, and he's used to being on the ground against and trying to push around 25 pounds less weight. It makes a big difference, huge. And while I, like a lot of people, still said, "Oh yeah, I," but I guess, I guess, uh, I gotta go with Connor still finding a way to pull it out. While I said that, man, I preached to myself and I preached to everybody who listened to me. Forget the fact that Nate Diaz has 10 losses. Forget all of that stuff. Nate is a crisp boxer. He's got great length. He's got good height. And when that goes to the ground, not only is he a better grappler than Conor McGregor is, he's going to have 25 extra pounds of weight that Conor McGregor is not used to dealing with. So um, I I picked Conor, but man, when, when Nate won, no surprise. No surprise. I still thought somehow... That Conor McGregor magic would still work its way out and Conor would win. But, you know, when it went, I was especially not surprised that it finished via rear naked choke. I mean, that was obvious. Now, to the other, to the co-main event, I, from day one that this fight was announced, that Holly Holm was going to be defending against Misha Tate, I said from day one, no questions asked, 100% positive, I am telling you, Misha Tate is going to win this fight. And everybody talked to me like I was some kind of crazy person. Like I was really insane. I mean, and I get all these tweets. You know what I love? I love getting these tweets from um, from people who don't know one-tenth about sports as I do. But anyway, I love getting these tweets from people when I say something about sports online. They go, oh, stick to movies. I hate that. I hate that when people say stick to movies. But even though I can, you know, I know 20 times more than they ever will about sports. But anyway, so, I mean, hey, I get stuff wrong in sports too. We all do. That's the fun about sports. But anyway, uh, I had all these people not just having some fun with me about, oh, come on, John, you're nuts. But like some people like viciously, venomously attacking me saying, I don't know the first thing about mixed martial arts and all this kind of stuff. Holly Holm is a crisp boxer and Misha Tate won't be able to deal with that. It's like, "Mm, nah, nah, I'm sorry. I've seen Misha Tate in the ring against crisp strikers. Not as crisp as Holly Holm. She's the best in the division, no doubt. But I've seen Misha Tate in there with crisp strikers and she knows how to deal with them. She knows how to dirty box. She knows how to make a fight dirty. She knows how to get inside. She knows how to take it to the ground if she needs it on the ground. She knows how to get it back up to her feet if it needs to get back on the feet. And Holly Holm, while she is a terrific striker, she's not a great grappler. 
and she was going to be exposed. And that's what happened. Look, that fight, now granted, Misha Tate won in the fifth round with only two minutes to go. But that fight, had had Holly Holm not been saved by the bell, she was going to lose, Holly Holm was going to lose that fight in the second round. Misha Tate had her locked up and Holly Holm was not going to get out. She was not going to get out. And so, like, I had absolutely zero doubt in my mind that Misha Tate was going to win that fight. Uh, and I said from day one, too, look, I was as surprised as anybody when Holly Holm beat Ronda Rousey. But Ra- she beat Ronda Rousey because Ronda Rousey fought like an idiot. And she has an idiot for a coach. Like, if you rewatch that Holly Holm-Ronda Rousey fight, listen to her coach in between rounds. Ronda Rousey went in like... Uh, she was defeated by her own ego because she went in there. It's like, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to knock out Holly Holm. It's like, I'm sorry. Holly Holm is a world-class kickboxer and a world champion boxer. You are not, Ronda Rousey, you are not going to go into the ring with Holly Holm and outstrike her. But she went in there and tried to strike with her like an idiot. And then in between rounds, even though she was getting her ass handed to her, Ronda Rousey's coach is like, oh, you're doing good. You're doing great. Everything's going well. It's like, no, she's not you fucking moron. Tell her the truth. Tell her, look, it's time to change plan. What we tried in the first round is not working. That's what you should have said. And even after Holly Holm did a really impressive knockout on Ronda Rousey, I said that the next time Ronda Rousey fights her, it will be a different fight. Ronda will win the rematch because hopefully she'll learn her lesson and she's not going to go in and fight like an idiot this time. She's going to go in and fight her style of fight, which Holly Holm will not have an answer for. And you know who else knew that? Misha Tate knew that. Misha Tate watched why Ronda Rousey, a girl that Misha can't beat because Misha's fought Ronda Rousey a couple of times and lost every time. But she watched that fight and Misha Tate knew that Ronda Rousey could have won that fight and should have won that fight against Holly Holm. And so she looked at that footage. She said to herself, I'm not going to make the same mistake Ronda Rousey did. I know how to fight this girl and I'm going to beat her. And she did. So I was really excited. Very happy for Misha Tate that she finally won that UFC. Cause you know, a lot of people have, you know, shit on uh, Misha Tate that, Oh, she, you know, she was a strike force champion. She'll never be the real champion in the UFC. So I'm really happy for her. I think she's a great ambassador for the sport. I think she'll be a great champion until she has to defend against Ronda Rousey and where Ronda Rousey will once again beat her again and get her title back. And then we'll see Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holm too. And this time Ronda Rousey will destroy Holly Holm. So especially now that Ronda Rousey's seen Misha Tate do what she should have done in the first place. So anyway, that's what I thought of UFC uh, 196. I'm really looking forward to the next one. All right, let's move on here. Um, Ab my hui. It's A-B-M-Y-T-H-W-W-E. Anyway, is writing, John, would Marvel really be dumb enough to let Sony make a Venom movie that is not going to connect with the Spider-Man slash Marvel Cinematic Universe? Now, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, on yesterday's podcast, we talked about how um, a report came out in Variety that Sony is looking to move forward with a standalone Venom film that is not connected to Spider-Man. Like, not just isn't going to have Spider-Man in it, but is not going to be connected to Spider-Man or this new MCU or the Spider-Man cinematic universe that they seem to be developing here. It ain't going to be connected to Spider-Man, which I think is really strange and odd. It sounds like a really dumb idea to me, um, but we'll have to see how it works out. But anyway... What Ab My Thui is asking is, would Marvel really be dumb enough to let Sony do that? Well, there's a couple of answers to that question. Answer number one is, Marvel doesn't have a say. It ain't up to Marvel. Venom is still Sony's character. Spider-Man is still Sony's character. Despite all the hoopla and everything after the big announcement about the new agreement between Sony and the new deal between Sony and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, despite the fact that Kevin Feige is going to be on as a producer on the standalone Spider-Man movies, everybody forgets this one simple fact. Spider-Man still belongs to Sony. Period. End of sentence. No ifs, no ands, no buts. And Marvel can't do anything with Spider-Man in their Marvel Cinematic Universe, because we know Spider-Man's going to be making an appearance in uh, Captain America Civil War. Guess what? They can't do anything with Spider-Man in that movie that Sony 
doesn't approve. Sony has to approve everything that Marvel wants to do with Spider-Man in their movie. That's just the way it is. Now, I'm sure when Marvel sends over a couple of their B-level characters to be in the Spider-Man standalone movies, I'm sure Marvel will have the same veto right with their characters as Sony does with theirs. So when you ask me, why would Marvel let Sony make a, a Venom standalone movie? Because Marvel doesn't get a say. Marvel doesn't get a say. It's totally up to, to Sony. Now, I'm sure Kevin Feige, if he hates the idea, he might get on the phone and say, hey, can you please not do that? Because it seems kind of stupid. And then maybe Sony will listen to him. I hope they do. But here's the other uh, interesting thing. I speculated on yesterday's show. And remember, this is still absolute pure speculation on my part, okay? I speculate. This is based on nothing. This is just pure speculation, pure wild imagination on my part, okay? My speculation was that the only way, like I don't understand why Sony would want to do a standalone Venom movie that isn't connected to your most popular character, to Spider-Man. Why would you even want to do that? My speculation on yesterday's show, and it's still my speculation today, is that Marvel doesn't want to use Venom in their MCU. My speculation at this point is that Marvel is the one not interested in using Venom and doesn't want Venom associated with their Marvel Cinematic Universe. And since Spider-Man is in their Marvel Cinematic Universe, that makes it problematic to connect Venom to Spider-Man. So my speculation, again, totally out of my wild imagination, this isn't based on any facts whatsoever, okay? Let me be very clear about that. But my speculation is that Sony went, well, okay, I mean, but we think Venom is a great character and we think people love Venom and want to see Venom. So fine, you don't want to use him in the MCU and you don't want us to connect him to Spider-Man. Fine, we're still going to use him as a character in our own movies. That's the only way I can think about this that even makes the remotest bit of sense. And it still doesn't make sense. Even my theory as completely being pulled out of my ass as it is, it still doesn't make any sense. I still can't understand why they would do it this way. But so that's that's my theory about uh, about what's going on there. Anyway, let's move on. We still got a few questions to get through. Uh, Sheeran MC writes, or Shreen MC writes, uh, John, have you heard anything about the Arrested Development movie? Um, well, you know, the Arrested Development movie is something I've been talking about for a few years now. It had to be five years ago that there was this, uh, Arrested Development panel. I can't remember what the event was that they were at, but all the cast from Arrested Development was on the stage and the writers were there and the show creators were there. And they said, and this is like five, six years ago, they said, uh, we are going to do a movie. We're going to do an Arrested Development movie. Now, I made a video at the time it's probably on my own personal YouTube channel. I made a video at the time saying, there's no way in hell they're doing an Arrested Development movie. It doesn't matter that they say they want to do it. No studio is going to put up 30, 40, 50 million dollars. No studio in their right mind is going to put up 30, 40, 50 million dollars to make a movie about a show that got canceled. Why did it get canceled? Because nobody freaking watched it. Because nobody watched it. And I said at the time, five years ago, I don't care that the showrunner and the writer is saying, we're taking steps now to make this a movie. I don't care. It ain't going to happen. There's no way that this is going to happen. Now, I said at the time in that same video, maybe they can make a return to TV for, for cheap, for really cheap, but there is no way a studio is going to put up $40 million production budget plus another $25 million marketing, put up $60, $70 million in total for a show, a movie based on a show that got canceled because nobody watched it. And all these people got so mad at me. But John, they would all say, they said they're doing this, so they're going to do it. And, and you know, then I always heard this too. Oh, John, you should understand. Yeah, maybe nobody watched it when it was on TV, but it's got a massive following now on DVD because of all that. Because now they got a massive, massive following. You make a movie now, it'll be a big, big hit. And I'm like, no, nope, ain't going to happen. And sure enough, the movie never happened. Now, what did happen was what I said might happen. Netflix picked it up and for a very small budget. They produced, uh, what was it, uh, 13 episodes, 15 episodes, I can't remember. 15 new episodes for Netflix. And I remember everybody saying, 
oh my God, it's going to break the internet once the new season of Arrested Development hits Netflix, it's going to break the internet, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? It didn't do all that well. As a matter of fact, that new show at the time that Netflix was doing, House of Cards, crushed it. Totally crushed Arrested Development. Now, at the beginning, I think back in January of 2015, producer Brian Grazer did say that he's looking at doing another 17-episode season. So he's talked about maybe doing another season. But that was a year ago that Brian Grazer said that. So I don't, and we haven't seen anything that makes it look like that's coming to fruition. So maybe Arrested Development gets another season on Netflix if you listen to Brian Grazer. But once again, those comments were made over a year ago and we haven't seen anything happening, but I will still stand by that we will never see an, a full feature length Arrested Development wide release studio film. It will never happen. If they do a quote-unquote movie, it'll be a Hulu movie, or it'll be a Netflix movie, or it'll be a video-on-demand movie. It will not, you will never see a full-blown Arrested Development, full-feature wide-release motion picture. It ain't going to happen. There's just no way it's going to happen. Because the show got canceled because nobody watched it, despite the fact that said, oh yeah, but now it's got a massive following. Really? Where's the massive following? Because they didn't show up to Netflix for it. Um, It's just probably never going to happen. So that's like, look, stranger things have happened, man. Stranger things have happened. So even though I'm sitting here saying it's never going to happen, you never know. I mean, that's what you got to end all these statements with is you never know. It's possible, but I would be incredibly shocked uh, if it did. All right, let's move on. Uh, Tubeville T, I like that name, Tubeville T writes, uh, John Cambia, TJCP. Will you ever have guests on like uh, the Schmoes or Schnepp? Yeah, yeah. Like that's one of the great things about this podcast I'm doing now is that it's so easy for me to do this podcast and I can record it anytime. And I don't even need to have Schnepp or Christian or Mark or Dennis or any of them. I don't even need to have them come to my place. We can just hop on Skype and I can just record them quick. I can record at two o'clock in the morning. I can record it at six o'clock at night after dinner. I can record it at midnight. It doesn't matter. It's so simple and easy. This is what I love about doing this podcast. So um, yes, you will absolutely. And once again, don't forget, if you're listening to this on Tuesday morning, which is when I'm dropping this, uh, make sure you go over to Clyder uh, video on YouTube later today and see the newest episode of uh, me and John Schnepp and Umberto Gonzalez on the new episode of Heroes. So make sure you check that out. All right, two more questions. Justin Vick writes, could you conceive of a Marvel, Marvel, <laughs> could you conceive of a Marvel zombies movie? Could be a crash grab, <laughs> why can't I read? Could be a cash grab before the inevitable Avengers reboot and reintroduce the Fantastic Four. Um, for those of you who don't know, there was kind of like an Elseworlds, there's a, those are very popular, these Elseworld kind of stories. There was kind of like an Elseworlds story. Uh, in Marvel, of Marvel zombies, where all the, the big Marvel characters were actually zombies. So it's a zombie source. You got zombie Captain America and all that kind of stuff. Um, no, I can't conceive of that ever happening. I think it'd be way too weird for the average general movie going on. It's, I also don't think Marvel is into the idea of doing these Elseworld, Elseworld spinoff kind of ideas. So I don't think that's going to happen. Plus, you mentioned it would be a cash grab. See, the thing is, I think it would be the opposite of a cash grab. I don't think they'd make any cash. I think it would just confuse way too many people. Um, you get hardcore comic book fans who would love to see it. But as I've talked about before, the hardcore comic book fans represent 1% to 5% of the general movie going audience. Hold on a second, I'm just going to take a sip of water. They represent about 1% to 5% of the general movie going audience. So you're going to have a whole bunch of people just, just be confused about what the hell is this when it's not even connected to anything. So it wouldn't even be a crash grab, man. It would just be a grab of desperation. So I, I don't think it would happen, but again, who knows? Uh, I said there were two questions left. Now there are two questions left. Uh, Clemo 24 writes, how long do you think it will be before we see changes at the Oscars in regards to race? Not next year. Films are finished. Um, well, look, here's the thing. And I, I get some people kind of mad at me for saying this and I don't know why, because I, I'm sorry, what I'm saying is just makes sense. I never understood this whole Oscar so white bullshit. And it was. The whole Oscar so white campaign was bullshit. Complete and utter bullshit. Now, you may be saying, but John, are you saying that there's not a race issue in Hollywood? Not at all. 
As a matter of fact, I will insist that there is a race issue in Hollywood. But the Oscars are not the problem. I made a video on my YouTube channel uh, once called, called The Oscar So White Campaign is Total Bullshit. And I totally stand by this. And actually, Morgan Freeman just made comments that completely support what I was what I was saying, which is this. The problem in Hollywood that has nothing to do with the Oscars is that there are not enough um, quality and significant leading characters being written for or awarded to non-white actors. And got to remember, the racial disparity in Hollywood is not just about white people and black people. It's about Latino people. It's about Asian performers. It's about everybody who's not white. There's not a lot of great roles being written, either A, written for, or B, being awarded to non-white actors. That is an issue in Hollywood. That has to be addressed and looked at, okay? So there is an issue. I totally, I totally agree that there is an issue with that and it needs to be addressed. However, to blame the Oscars for the fact that, you know, there was no non-white actors, and there was lots of non-white people nominated for lots of awards that night, but no non-white people were, as a matter of fact, the guy who won Best Director is Hispanic. So, I mean, there's that. But anyway, all the acting awards, uh, there was no nominees for black actors, black actors. But guess what? There were no black performances that year that deserved it. Was Will Smith good in concussion? Yes. But was he better than any of the five nominees who did get nominated for best actor? Hell no, he wasn't. No, he was not. Um, Michael B. Jordan was really good in Creed. Was he better than any of the five guys nominated for best actor? Nope. Nope, he wasn't. He was great. He was wonderful. I loved him in Creed. If you've listened to me for any amount of time, you know I am a huge fan of Michael B. Jordan. By the time that dude's career is done, he will have one or two Oscars on his mantle. He's awesome, but he didn't deserve a nomination this year. Sorry, he didn't. And to me, the Oscars need to be not based on meeting a quota. It needs to be based on who gave the best performances that year. Look, two years ago, I made a case that I was very happy that Matthew McConaughey won. I was very happy for him. He was wonderful in the, in the Dallas Buyers Club. I have no problem that he took on an Oscar. But I believe that Chiwetel Ejiofor, if I had a vote, and obviously I don't have a vote, but if I had a vote in the Oscars, Chiwetel Ejiofor would have won Best Actor that year. Why? Because he was a black actor? No, because I thought he was the best performance that year. And he was nominated, didn't win. So, okay, that, that's fine, but at least he was nominated. This year, it's not about quotas. And I'm, I'm sorry, there was no, there's no compelling argument about that regardless of color or race, that the five actors, the five actresses, the five supporting actors and the five supporting actresses, the one, the one I think you could have made a, a case for, the one example you could have made a case for was Idris Elba in Beasts of No Nation. But like John Schnepp and I both were saying for like eight months Long before the Academy Awards were even coming close, we always thought that Beasts of No Nation was going to have trouble at the Oscars because it's a Netflix film, not because it's a white film or a black film or an Asian film or a Latino film. We always thought, eh, this, this movie's not going to have many Oscar, Oscar hopes because it's a new paradigm with Netflix and, and, and streaming and things like that. And we just didn't feel that the Academy Award would give a lot of consideration to a Netflix film. So I wasn't surprised when Idris Elba didn't get nominated, but it was because he was in a Netflix movie. As Look, if Beasts of No Nation, I believe this, had Beasts of No Nation been released by Warner Brothers on 2,000 screens as a wide release and it was a full motion, Hollywood motion picture release, had that happened, I believe Idris Elba would have got nominated for Best Supporting Actor and would have deserved it. But before race ever became a question about it, eight months ago, I never thought it had a chance because it's a Netflix film. So you see, there is an issue here. There is an issue. There are not enough great roles being either written for or being given to or awarded to non-white actors. That is an issue. We need better representation of black actors, of Hispanic actors, of Asian actors, of, of any non-white you know, race that you can possibly imagine or think of. That's an issue. That has to change. But the issue is not with the Oscars. The Oscars have one job. Just nominate who are the best nominees. And generally speaking, they got it right. I'm sorry, they got it right this year. Not across the board, but 
I'm sorry, like I saw a concussion and I'm a big Will Smith fan, but I just don't see an argument that Will Smith should have gotten, should have gotten a nomination. Nope. Don't see it. I just don't see an argument that, uh, that Michael B. Jordan should have got a nomination. They were both great, but I think the five guys who did get nominated were a little bit better. It's like a couple of years ago when Tom Hanks didn't get nominated for Captain, oh hell, what was the name of that movie where he's the captain of the ship that gets taken over by pirates? But anyway, uh, Captain Phil, I can't remember the name of the movie, but Tom Hanks was great in that movie. He was great in that movie, but there were five other guys who were better that weren't named Tom Hanks. And so he didn't get nominated. And, and that's why I think the situation here is here. So you're asking me, do I think that the Oscars, there will be a change in the Oscars I, to me, there's not a change that really needs being done in the Oscars, except for what the president of the Academy has said, that they're going to implement new things to make sure we get more diverse voting members in the Academy. I think that's great. They're going to have new outreach programs. I think that's great. I think you're going to see a change in the Oscar culture. But in the midst of that change, what I hope doesn't change is the Oscars is just about awarding excellence and never becomes a quota system. And if Hollywood would do its job and start to diversify a little bit. Like, I'm not saying only give white guys, you know, 10 roles out of every 20 films. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not calling for any kind of a quota system. But what I am saying is that there's a huge disparity. And if Hollywood does its job by giving, by either writing or awarding better characters and better movies to non-white actors, then you're going to see that reflected in the Oscars. That's the, the system will work then because you're going to see that reflected in the Oscars. But until Hollywood changes their system, you're not going to see a change in the Oscars. And nor should you see a change in the Oscars because the Oscars is just a reflection of what is supposed to be the reality. So anyway, that's just my thought on it. All right. Now we finally get to the final question of the day. And that's by Nuggety75 who wrote, who writes, uh, John Campia, what did you think of the Ghostbusters trailer? Hashtag TJCP. Uh, I thought it was a big pile of shit. Is, is that direct enough? I thought it was awful. I thought it was a terrible trailer. Um, and look, I if you guys have been following me, you know, I'm one of the guys who I have been excited about this new Ghostbusters. I'm one of these guys who have been defending the new Ghostbusters. I'm the guy who on Movie Talk over and over again said, these are four of the funniest women in the world right now. You've got a great director attached who has worked great with uh, Melissa and worked great with this cast before. This is going to be great. And when people say, well, why does it have to be all women? I would say, why did the first one have to be all men? I mean, I've been excited for this film. I am cheering for this film. I am in this film's corner, but I call it like I see it. I still think the new Ghostbusters is going to be a good movie. I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be funny. And I think it's going to be fun. But that, but I'm going to call it like I see it. This trailer was a bag of shit. It was terrible. I never smiled once. I never grinned. Nothing felt um, nostalgic about it. There was one little shot of Slimer, but that didn't even, that felt forced instead of, instead of nostalgic. It should have felt nostalgic and it didn't. They put together a bad trailer. And you know, some people would write on Twitter, well, people just don't want to see a good kick-ass action comedy being led by women. And I responded to it by saying, no, I really do want to see those a lot. I just don't want to see shitty trailers. And this was a shitty trailer. So, but remember, it's just a trailer. We have seen, how many times have we seen great trailers to bad movies? And how many times have we seen bad trailers to what turned out to be good movies? A lot. It happens all the time. So I'm not going to get worked up by the fact that the first trailer for Ghostbusters was terrible. I'm not going to get worked up about it. And I'm not going to change my opinion that I still think Ghostbusters, this new Ghostbusters is going to be good. I think it's going to be good and funny and entertaining because I trust the director. I trust the performers. I think they're going to give us something worth enjoying and worth watching. But if you're just going to ask me what I think of the trailer, I thought it was all kinds of terrible. All right, guys, that will do it for me for this installment of the John Campia podcast. Uh, thank so much uh, for joining me. Listen, don't forget, follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just following me at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast. We're in iTunes. We're on all the Android podcast subscribers. And even do me a favor, even if you don't use iTunes as your podcast subscription, go over to iTunes, subscribe to this podcast in iTunes and rate this podcast and leave a comment. It would help out a great deal. Leave comments and you can follow this show 
show also on my, I put it up on my YouTube channel in an audio only form. So you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash John Campia. Make sure you follow me there. And I will be back again. I don't know if I'll be back again tomorrow. I might be back tomorrow. Might not be back till Thursday. Keep your eyes open. We'll be back one way or the other. Uh, so thanks so much for joining, guys. My name is John Campia. And until next time, bye-bye.